Welcome to The Brainstorm, episode 46. Today, we're talking CRISPR GPT and humanoid robots. And we've got Rong with us, who's our newest addition to the genomics team and uh, the real expert here, because Nick, I'm, I don't think you are. Yep, definitely not me, but it's great to be in person. With it is, it is. This is actually filmed during our, our on-site week, and we're having a good time seeing everyone in person. Only the second episode in person. It's true. So. It's true. Um, all right. So let's kick it off with just catching everyone up wrong. What is CRISPR? Okay. So um, CRISPR is a technology that can um, that scientists use to like cut out a specific piece of gene. So basically, it works by several components. So first, you've got the um, nuclease, which is the cutting like the scissors. And then the second is something you call a guide RNA. Um, it's, a, um, it's a guide that um, tells, tells the scissors like where to cut. It's like so, the, it gives the dotted line. Yeah, hmm. mm -hmm. kind of like that. <laughs> yeah. So that's a very like a high level um, introduction of the CRISPR, um, just what it does. But if you're like interested, there's definitely like more like nuances and uh, such as like which type of um, guide RNA to use. And then also just so you know, like there are a lot of like um, nucleases, which um, is the CAS um, in the, which is the scissors in the CRISPR system. So yeah, so just a high level intro. We, we like to keep it high level around okay. here. <laughs> <laughs> um, so how does... AI begin to play a role, ChatGPT, how is it being utilized in this space? Yeah, so um, so here um, our topic, the CRISPR GPT. So what people does is, um, so these group of researchers actually started to notice that people are using the general like ChatGPT to design experiments. And then what they found is that the general ChatGPT cannot design a very good experiment. For instance, you ask for something like, hey, I want to knock out um, a gene. Knock out, by the way, it means that I literally want to like cut off this gene. Um, like in human, like specific, let's say gene A. And then um, chat GPT will tell you a protocol, maybe that's for mice or maybe that's for plants. So mm -hmm. that's not good. So um, these group of researchers, what they did is they trained their um, GPT with a lot of like uh, gene editing, meaning like mainly like CRISPR related um, literatures so that the, um, the system, so that the GPT knows how to um, like, give you the best protocols for, um, in terms of, for instance, like which nuclease or the scissors to use and then which guide RNA to design. So um, basically it's, I would put it this way. So um, it's a very, <clears throat> sorry, it's a very efficient way for scientists to like design um, experiments. And so are there examples? I know, right, ChatGPT comes out people say, oh, I cut down this process in my organization by hours. Are there mm -hmm. some concrete examples of people using CRISPR GPT yet, or is it still just in the hands of the people who created it? It is still um, like an unpublished, but preprint. Okay. So um, preprint um, like a paper. And I think it's believe it's still with the people who um, trained the GPT. Um, and then, but based on their experience, it works pretty well because they, um, what they did is, okay, so I have this like CRISPR G GPT, how does it do? So they gave it uh, like a concrete task to knock out like several genes at the same time. And then completely like non, like human in like uh, interfered design. And then you can just follow exactly what CRISPR G GPT tells you. And then they successfully like knocked out those genes, which is not easy to do. So um, so I would say that's the only case um, it's been used, but I do have confidence that this will be used more and more because I can tell you like as a researcher myself. So normally a grad student, meaning like a PhD trainee, um, the trainee students, um, like what they will do is for CRISPR experiment depend on the organisms. Organism meaning you're working on mice or like human cell lines. Um, it could take anywhere from like nine months to three years. Wow. Wow. To successfully knocking down one gene. 
So That's why? Crazy. Yeah, it is so crazy. So basically, like、uh, think about like a PhD in five or six years, the majority of the time you're creating your like your mutant lines. So me, me, meaning that you're knocking down a specific gene. So for instance, like my friend, like she works with mice, and then she took.、Um, Like three years to just knocking out that specific gene she wants to study, and then took another three to actually do experiments. Wow! So why、okay. is this process,、um, this CRISPR GPT, important? Is that during the three years, what she does is so she has to like skim through the literatures. There are like thousands of literatures. She couldn't like. Get them all at once because、mm-hmm. you know, like human, that we have enough time. Yeah, we have like energy、um, limitation. So she would like skim through the literature,、um, and then after, for instance, after、um, she skim through the literature, she starts to like design experiments, and only to find that what she half doesn't work. And then there's another round of like looking into the literature and troubleshooting, and then it doesn't work. So、um, I think with the CRISPR GPT. Those situations will be alleviated because these GPTs are trained with the、um, with the existing liter- literatures. So what it will do is it could give you like a better starting starting point. I'm not saying it's giving you a perfect point as to where to start your experiment, but <clears throat> it at least gives you like a more closer to optimal one.、Um, so, so, so you think that this could cut down. <laughs> Some PhDs from you know six seven years to three years. Definitely. So I've heard like extreme, just an extreme story here. So、um, like CRISPR. So think about this technology. It doesn't work equally on mul- on every gene. So for instance, I want to knock out gene A, and it could like knock out gene A. But then、um, if I want to knock out gene B with the same system, it might not work at all. So.、Um, Yeah. So basically, another extreme case is、um, if you are working with a gene that's not easy to knock out, and then、um, so basically it could take up to five years. So think about a PhD、that's、in six、crazy. years. Yeah. So、mm. if we could like cut down that time with the better like experiment planting、uh, planning system,、um, and then with like a Um, this system that creates like a gives you a better like optimal a better like starting point. I think we could like our PhD students or even the researchers in the pharma companies could spend like maybe the just like one cut down the three year to like one year or even like below one year and spend the rest of the time like to actually work on the scientific discoveries to actually like find something that's very like. Uh, very useful. Like I'm not saying that creating these、um, knockouts are not useful. It's just we need to do this more efficiently.、Mm-hmm. And just to understand this, you're saying there are some times when you're going out and you're researching and you're creating an experiment,、mm-hmm. and it could be that another PhD candidate has already tried this, and you have no idea because you're not caught up on the literature, and you could have spent a year or two trying. The same exact experiment someone else has. Exactly. And you're saying that you know if you have a, a system that can read through all the literature,、mm-hmm. For understand you, it, you can be you know much more efficient as a whole research body、yes. across the country. Yes. And and actually try to push the boundary instead of potentially duplicating someone else's work that has already failed.、Mm-hmm. That's well said. Because like、um, another thing I want to mention is this is not. Um, only like CRISPR GPT,、mm-hmm. so it's very like I think it's this type of things like、um, using GPT to better help you to like integrate through the literature and then plan your experiments, give you the m- most like optimal design.、Um, I think it's very it should be very useful in the、um, in the research process in general because honestly, like when you do research. Uh, do research like the majority time is you design your experiment, and a chunk, a, another chunk of time is like you spend like researching the literature, reading through the papers. So like I, so like for for me, like I used to read like um like around like forty fifty 
papers like per week. Wow. But then <laughs> that was a lot. 40 to 50 yeah. posts on X a day. <laughs> that's that's the limit. <laughs> yeah. But then like if like in an area, there's like thousands of papers. And for instance, those people doing like protein experiments, they have like thousands or even like 10,000s of experiments. How are they going to like read mm, through yeah. all of that? Right. Wow. So that's when this comes into play. That is fascinating. And it will be very exciting to see how this does speed up the progress within the mm -hmm. space because as you're pointing it out it seems like there's a ton of inefficiencies but yep. yeah thank you for coming on this was super insightful sam let's switch to you humanoid robots In your favorite seat. your favorite subject tell us all about it well i'd say one of the i'm not going to go all about it we're going to go okay we're gonna, fine, we're sure. go, yeah. go select okay. i will say the most exciting thing that we've seen recently or in in our sphere right there's a uh, Tesla bot picking and placing cells in the factory. Um, I think that's pretty cool. But I, I, what I wrote about and what we discussed is the topic and debate around humanoid itself, right? And it's like, why humanoid versus something else? Like legs are complicated. Why wouldn't you just put wheels? Hands are complicated. Why wouldn't you just put, you know, pinchers? And I think the right way to think about this is to replace humanoid with generalizable. And sure, you can put a wrench at the end of a robot, uh, but then it's not generalizable. It's super good. It's better than human hands at doing a specific task. But the reason that humanoid is so exciting is inherently because of that generalizability. And humans are what the world was created for to manufacture, right? We didn't mm -hmm. create it for anyone else other than humans. And so when you look at the manufacturing landscape in the US, people tend to think of auto manufacturing. And these are huge firms where they've automated it down to a science over you know, decades. And sure, there's still human roles there and that will get replaced over time. But there's this enormous opportunity in the other side, which is small firms, which is, so I'm looking at the numbers here, you know, Close to 5 million people in manufacturing work in firms that have less than 500 employees. And uh, that's the vast majority of, not the vast majority, that is the majority of where you're seeing this bucket of people. And those firms are not doing high volume throughput, so they can't have a super specific automation regime where you're hiring someone to come in and program a bot to do something a million times, right? They need something generalizable in order to automate it all. Mm -hmm. I have two questions. One, the, I guess, standardizing on a humanoid robot, even for those that would claim, you know, you can have single purpose customized robots, couldn't you just swap out different parts of the humanoid robot to fit a specific need at a certain point, as in maybe, you know, hands are not the best at, you know, screwing in bolts. You just, you know, replace the hand with a, a wrench or something. <laughs> I feel like you can just begin to swap out different parts to fit the need. But as long as you have kind of a standardized body, it would make that a possibility from a cost perspective. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And I think, I think the interesting thing will be the design but also the training, right? If you're doing deep learning and that, it's like you got to then collect all of the data for the robot to like know which right. part to put in right. and all of that. Yeah. Where it's like already there's all of the power tools we have are designed True. for the human hand. True. True. That makes sense. Yeah. Uh, second question, the Optimus video, was this just threads FUD? Or was it actually teleoperated and they're collecting data by doing that? And what is it's that the purpose of having it teleoperated? Or did someone uh, recreate a video and, and create some some fake AI that so, was meant to discredit the video itself? <laughs> so they, I haven't seen it on X, so I don't know what the truth is. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. That's where truth lies. Uh, there were multiple parts of the video. In one part of the video, you see a line of optima, optimuses, optimi, optimi, if you will. Yeah, optimi. Uh, and they're being trained. They're being teleoperated for training purposes. 
But then there is part of it where it's showing the robot in the factory picking and placing cells. And I believe Elon uh, posted saying that this was not teleoperated. There's no human in the loop in this as well. So there were, you know, both instances in the video. Okay. But there is definitely the case of no human in the loop and it executing a task. So taking the training data of the teller operation and actually implementing it. And that's the second video. Exactly. First video. And I think that's a, also a good point, right? Collecting the huge amount of data, right? Tesla's doing it with vehicles on the road. Uh, there's not necessarily assets in the field to collect the data you need for humanoid robots. And so that's being done with you know, synthetic data, but synthetic data is only so good. It's being done with teleoperation, right? Some people are strapping GoPros on factory yeah. workers to collect the data from what they're doing. I would imagine that it takes much less training data to do some of these tasks. As in, there's not a lot of edge cases that can happen when you're just taking a cell, a battery cell off a conveyor belt and putting it into a rack. You know, not much is going to go wrong that's going to throw the robot off its task. Right. There's task. No, no cells that are drunk driving. <laughs> right. So, I mean, I guess from that standpoint, it, you could begin to knock out pretty simple tasks with a small amount of training data if you were to, you know, outline and say, here are some of the easiest tasks a humanoid robot can knock out today with, you know, the highest return for us, we can, you know, train this in, I would imagine, a couple of days, months. How, how much training data do you think they actually needed to create the video of uh, the one robot? I, I think you're right. I think it's less than you would imagine. Right? And I think other humanoid robot companies out there have been on record saying, you know, maybe like 50 to 100 attempts and they can get pretty good at yeah. a specific task like this. Right. Interesting. Uh, I actually have a question. So, um, like, like, I'm not an expert in that, but I'm just wondering, like, do you know the cost for like a, to train like a humanoid robot? That's a great question. I do not know. And, okay. and the, at least the cost for the robot itself varies greatly currently. Um, you know, Elon's said getting it down to like half the price of a car, I believe. Uh, I think in China, there's some for mm -hmm. sale in like the $45,000, $50,000 range. Mm -hmm. um, on the training side, I think it is similar to the arms race that we're seeing across the board for models. And I imagine that Tesla and others are going to be utilizing whatever large you know, compute clusters they have access to. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I don't have a concrete answer there, but it's it's definitely something we should get yeah. it, get into. But the reason I'm asking is for, because you're talking about these like humanoid robots for like small manufacturing mm -hmm. things, like not so many rep repetitive things. Um, I think they could potentially be used in those specialized labs. Setting. Oh, interesting. Yeah, mm -hmm. because... Um, like we like you know like in the lab like we probably work until like 10 p.m or stuff and then we have to go home and sleep but uh -huh. then there are like still experiment running so do you think the humanoid robots can like take um take over what we are doing and then work at night for us and to increase the productivity i i definitely think so i think the interesting question will be how quickly can humanoid robots take over tasks mm -hmm. and exactly to what you're saying it's like the first thing they're going to do is take over you know concrete tasks right mm -hmm. if you're working in a lab one of your jobs right you're going to be micro pipetting mm -hmm. or doing something like yeah. that but it's like you are super intelligent and you're doing all these other things you're coordinating with other people and you're saying this is the next step that we need mm -hmm. to do and so, you know, we have the potential for the humanoid robot to do the physical side. Mm -hmm. And then it's interesting because it will tie in kind of with the CRISPR GPT or yeah. the chat GPT. And it's like, how do you get the intelligence for the other bundle of tasks that an uh, employee is responsible for? Do you imagine that this ends up being something where maybe a company begins to ship the hardware? So the actual humanoid robot, you have a general software framework you know a a, a a model powering this and then it's you know self-training as in if i were to purchase a humanoid robot i want it to do specific tasks for me so don't fold my I, sheets like that right <laughs> I, I just you know tell or show mm -hmm. the you know the humanoid robot a few times how i do this and it's simply able to just learn and 
you know, repeat. I think that's a potential future. Right. Um, yeah, especially if you can, like if it's already pre-trained and then it's capable. And we've seen this even without humanoid robots, with just collaborative robots, you know, being able to easily train it, drag its arm from here to here and say, like, this is how you pick in place. Like, this is the range of motion I want you to take. Yeah. I think that's definitely a potential outcome for humanoid yeah. robots. Because they're doing that with the Rabbit R1, which mm. we've seen the reviews, not great. <laughs> But the idea there is that, you know, they're shipping a product that doesn't have all of the capabilities it can have, but they're allowing users to actually build in those capabilities. So they have a whole testing and training area mm -hmm. for specific users. If you want to show the Rabbit R1 how to navigate a certain app, you can actually do it, you know, several times until it understands how to mimic you. And I would imagine you can replicate that exact process with a humanoid robot for various different tasks. Yeah, yeah. It's pretty uh, interesting. Maybe, Nick, as we wrap up, you like to make bold predictions about unit sales of various products. <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> I know, I'm just saying, you got Apple, you got the Vision Pro, you, you got that one, That's, you know. Yes, uh, sure. Rabbit R1, um, how's it going to do? Um. I, you know, I think this space is really interesting and stay tuned. We have a, a great piece coming out on what we think is going to happen with consumer AI. So very excited to get that out there. It's kind of our, our whole thesis on, you know, how this could be monetized and how different consumers will use it and who could potentially be winners. Um, I think, you know, what we're seeing is, again, we're very early days um, and we're, the market is still not sure if these need to be uh, separate pieces of hardware or potentially apps. I think that's the big uh, debate right now. And everyone that's reviewed the device has said, why isn't this an application? There's very clear reasons. I think we've gone over it in this podcast, why it is its own separate hardware. But I think, you know, fitting it back to how we already navigate the digital world is going to be extremely important. As in, you know, I think it will be attached or tied to different hardware as in, you know, maybe your smartwatch or your AirPods, but do we need a separate application that Rabbit has built? Probably not, um, but that has its own implications, right? Because Apple and Google would control, you know, the majority of the smartphone market. And if it just ends up being, you know, an OS level agent, as in Siri becomes uh, as smart as some of the, the tools out there, ChatGPT perplexity, that has its own implications. Um, but, you know, all is discussed in this paper that's coming out from us, so stay tuned. Um, I think what will happen with these um, devices is a lot of experimentation. It's going to, I think, begin to train habits within users. They're going to be more accustomed to, you know, talking, having conversations instead of just direct querying. Uh, if you are thinking about getting any of these devices, I think, just based on reviews and my own personal use, the Meta a uh, the Meta Ray Ban glasses, and I know I sound like a broken record, I understand, <laughs> but they actually have I think the best use case for AI. And I actually tweeted about this, and the reason is because because it's AI third, AI third. Thank you, Sam. You read my tweets. I read your tweets. You read uh, my tweets. Your posts. You my posts. Yes, uh, but it's you know I think to train users to get used to having to to talk to these AIs because it's more conversational. You have to have use cases they're already familiar with. So with the Ray-Ban glasses, they're a pair of sunglasses first or just normal eyewear. Then it's a camera, which is it's actually a great camera. And then third is obviously the AI. So it's kind of this Trojan horse into building habits for consumers to understand and to adapt to, you know, to 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 using AI on a consumer level. Great. Well, wrong. Thank you for joining us. We'll see all of you next week, but we won't see all of you next week in person. <laughs> I will see. Ron. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's wrong. And I will be hanging out. You'll be. I'll you'll be, be gone. Off. I'll be, you'll off. be gone. On just on a screen. All yeah. right. We'll see everyone next week. See everyone. Bye.